All right, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. It is 12.15. I will tell you, uh, just to uh, lower expectations, I finished working on the speech eight minutes ago. Um, it's been a busy weekend, let's just say. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for joining us today for the State of the University Address. Uh, during the presentation, there will be three opportunities for interaction. Uh, first, at the conclusion of my talk, which I hope will be in about 20 minutes, we will take any questions or comments on the new long-range plan and what our focus will be for the year, because that's the main topic of my talk. Then at the conclusion of Frank's presentation, he will take any questions on any academic issue connected to the long-range plan, because that's the focus of his talk. There are three ways to get those questions to us. They're on the board here. Um, uh, and uh, Suzanne Shaw, our Vice President for Marketing and Communication, will run this process and ask any questions that are submitted in one of these three ways. Then at the end, once we've answered uh, the questions that are submitted electronically or on cards, we will take any question uh, or any comment on any topic directly from you at a mic that will be passed around. So plenty of opportunities to uh, uh, have dialogue and submit questions to either Frank or me. Okay, so before we talk about the long range plan and the uh, action items for this year, um, I do want to highlight some of the good things that have happened on the university on the la in the last 12 months. And I've got six of those that I want to focus on. Uh, the first is enrollment. Our enrollment continues to increase. As a system uh, this fall, we have exactly 26,000 students on campus, uh, in our system, on our campuses. In Springfield, we have 24,116 students. Those are both records. They continue a string of five consecutive years of enrollment growth at Springfield and as a system. As a part of that, we have more new undergraduate students than we've ever had before, including the most new transfer students ever, the most underrepresented students ever. In fact, we have more transfer students than any other public university in our state. Yeah, students wanna come here and that's a good thing and we can clap for that. As you have seen this year in our newspaper and on television, all universities in Missouri and in the Midwest are not growing. And so I'm very pleased that we are growing in challenging times. Frankly, I believe enrollment growth is, a, is the best metric that the university is healthy. And moreover, without enrollment growth, we could not hire new faculty, expand programs, or increase comp compensation. We've seen in Missouri what happens when enrollment decreases significantly. This year, when the University of Missouri at Columbia lost students, this resulted in a hiring freeze, no merit increases, and the closure of residence halls and buildings. Second, we improve compensation for our employees, and I want to highlight three uh, areas on the slide behind me. We were able to do a 2% across the board raise. That was more than twice the rate of inflation, which was less than 1%. Uh, specifically, it was 0.8%. We were able to fund year three of the full professor incentive program. That means now 52 full professors have received a $5,000 raise in the last three years. And additional money was allocated to each cost center to improve staff salaries for the second year in a row as a result of a staff senate initiative. Not included in these numbers are benefit increases as we were able to expand sick leave benefits for both faculty and staff. Also not included in these numbers are equity adjustments uh, that were done uh, and paid for by the cost centers. So of the 6.3 million new dollars we had to spend this year, slightly more than half went into improving the pay improving pay and benefits, not counting those equity adjustments made by departments. And another $900,000 went to new faculty position, our largest commitment in the last five years 
uh, to this. In fact, we have put $2.3 million in the last three years into hiring new faculty lines. In short, 64 percent of our new money this fiscal year went into compensation increases for all and new faculty positions, and I think we should be proud of that as a university. Third, we had a successful year in the state capitol. Uh, in contrast to states of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Illinois, which decreased funding for state higher education, our General Assembly passed a budget signed by the governor that gave us a 4.5% increase in state appropriations. Ours was larger than some of the other universities because we made all of our performance funding measures and because for the second time in our history there was an equity component. What does an equity component mean? It means it rewards enrollment growth and we grew uh, and that was factored into the formula. Um, the result of that was we were able to hold our in-state undergraduate tuition flat, continuing to make uh, college affordability a priority. Second, uh, we were appropriated $5 million as a state funds match for private money to help construct Glass Hall. There is unfortunately a caveat or an asterisk by that uh, slide because uh, uh, a little less than $2 million is being withheld as a result of some um, um, tax cuts, bills that uh, uh, the legislature overrode the governor's veto of. Uh, I would tell you this will not alter our timeline on completion. We will work to have the money released and or fill in with private funds to get that project done on time. And then finally, we received a million dollars of ongoing money to begin a new mechanical engineering program with Missouri S&T. Likewise, they received the same appropriation. We hope to begin recruiting students for fall of 17. Finally, not on the chart, but also important, no campus conceal and carry legislation passed. I would tell you, this will be a continuing battle next year. And we may need to call on every single person in, in this room to help us get to a point uh, that legislation passes that is acceptable uh, and, and, and appropriate and safe uh, for us. So more to come on that. Fourth, we were successful in raising external funds, bringing in over $18 million for the third straight year in gifts, and we brought in almost $25 million in grants and contracts for by far the biggest year ever in this revenue category. $43 million between these two uh, components. That's almost real money. Uh, five, we were able to improve. Okay, it is real money. All right. Uh, five, we, were, we continue to improve our physical plant by beginning the renovation and expansion of Glass Hall, by adding a storm shelter at Sun Villa, expanding the chilled water loop, among a host of other renovation projects. These new and renovated buildings and projects will improve teaching, learning, recruiting, safety, sustainability, and the student experience and raise our profile as a major university. And finally, we use the year as a planning year to complete the new long range plan and put together the first year's action plan. Frank is going to highlight some of the academic achievements in his talk and when he is done, I think you will agree that this was another extraordinary year in the life of Missouri State University. Now, let me jump to that second piece there, the long range plan. And I wanna talk, I wanna spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about that. You should each have uh, received a long range plan in hard copy, looks like this. It's called Implementing the Vision. Uh, it is also can be found online. Uh, if your hard uh, copy made it into the round file and you didn't keep that, uh, at missouristate.edu backslash long range plan. This is not a document that Frank and I put together by ourselves over a weekend. I know people believe that, but it's not. This is the culmination, I hope you know this, this is the culmination of the work of hundreds of people over two years. The first year, you'll remember, was a visioning process where task forces of mostly faculty worked on six topics selected as critical to the future of, of the university, 
by a steering committee composed again of mostly faculty. The six topics are on the slide behind me. They are academic profile, student experience, diversity and inclusion, globalization, infrastructure, and funding. In the second year, we took that report and that work and using the same six categories and the same six vision statements each task force had put together, prepared this document and set our strategic priorities and university goals in each of the six categories. This was a very open and inclusive process to set these strategic goals and directives. They were discussed at every single open meeting of the Board of Governors during the past year. There was a steering committee of Frank, Dr. Cisco, and I that oversaw a working group led by Dean Gloria Galenis. Uh, the, the members of that committee are now on the board. This group wrote the plan and made presentations to dozens of faculty, staff, and student groups and sought feedback through those activities, plus a website, email, inside Missouri State publications, and multiple town hall meetings. Our objective was to create a single document that almost everything we do should be connected to. Let me encourage you to read the plan. If you've already read the plan, read it again. It will be the foundation of what we will be working on for the next five years. When you do that, you will see that there is a lot of material here. And so a couple of questions may have jumped out at you. How do we achieve the goals set forth in the plan? What do we work on first? Because we know we can't work on everything at the same time. Let me, let me tackle that second question first because it's really answered by the action plan of 2016-17, which we have just finalized and which we shared with the campus community in my cliff note of September 6th. Again, Administrative Council, Academic Leadership Council, and our board have all been involved in its preparation. And while we will work on parts of each of the six strategic areas during the year, our major focus this year, and frankly, likely to be our major focus in the next three to four years, will be on two subjects. First, increasing the number of graduates from our university. And second, improving the diversity and inclusion practices of our campus. Why this focus? I wanna, I wanna, I wanna go through seven reasons uh, of how and why we ended up with this focus. The first is, the two focuses are connected, as you will see when I share some data. Second, every unit can participate in these goals because everything counts on the graduation, uh, on the graduation agenda. Undergraduate students, graduate students, certificates, everything will count. Every academic unit can participate. And every unit can work to improve its climate and culture and inclusiveness. Third, Everything we do should promote student success. It's the primary stated objective of the long range plan. And if we are not graduating our students from all backgrounds, we are not carrying out our mission. Fourth, the economy of our state and nation needs more college graduates. Two thirds of all new jobs now require post-secondary education and most require at least a bachelor's degree. That's why our state and our nation have set goals that 60% of working age adults have a post-secondary credential by 2025. We're in the 40 percentile range in Missouri. So all colleges and universities in our state are going to have to produce more graduates if we are going to have a chance of succeeding this goal and continuing to create economic prosperity. We are well positioned to do our part. Fifth. We have room for improvement. I'm gonna share some university data with you here. And for the first slide you'll see is on the number of our graduates. Uh, so, so these are, let me tell you what you're looking at first. These are fiscal year numbers. So uh, for example, fiscal year 16 would be those students who graduated in the summer and fall of 2015 and the spring of 2016, okay? 
Um, and what you'll see from these numbers is for the first, for, for, for there are five years of data pictured on the slide, and for the first four years, we're essentially flat, right at about 4,400 or a little more. And then this last year, we were able to take a pretty significant jump of up 200. Frankly, we think as we offer more programs and more opportunities for certificates and work to improve graduation and retention rates, there is a lot of room for growth uh, in the number of credentials, um, uh, degrees, and certificates that people earn. The next slide um, takes a look at our graduation rates. And if you look at this slide, you'll see that really our graduation rate has not improved in the last five years. We're in that 52 to 55 percentile. Now, it's not horrible for a comprehensive university. It still puts us in, a, in the top third. And so under performance funding, we are getting sustained excellence for this award, but, but, we're, not, uh, but we're not moving uh, the number. And if we're able uh, to move this number, um, then, the, then the number of people that we are able to graduate will increase. I'm going to I'm going to give you some subcategories of this, so we're going to come back to this in a moment, so you can get in your mind. We're in that 53 to 55 percentile uh, graduation rate. The next slide shows the data on our first to second year retention rates, and. Um, we had been at about 75% for seven or eight years. And then a year ago, two falls ago, we were able to bump that up to 78%. We were really, through, through some specific targeted work, um, we were very interested to see what that number was going to be for this fall. And so that last number is fall 2016. So that was official a week ago. And we were able to hold the 78% and even bump it up to 79%. So we are making progress here, but I will tell you, we are on this number, we're only at the 15 percentile for, for our category. The, 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 uh, the, the performance funding measure for sustained excellence, or the top third, would be 83%. And our competitors are, uh, that we're competing with students for now around us, uh, the University of Arkansas, the University of Missouri, are in that 83 to 86%. Now, they, they take a little better student than we do, but clearly we have the potential to move this number, and, and through some very targeted programs we have seen that we have moved this number, uh, particularly the GEP class, some, some additional advising incentives, the, some work that's being done with first generation students, we can continue to improve this number. Why do I talk about that? Because um, um, th there is, uh, that brings us to, to reason number six. There is a social justice basis to work uh, on this as well. You know, if students come to us, particularly first generation students, Pell eligible students, underrepresented students, hoping to change their lives and the lives of their families for generations to come. And they go home without a degree, without the ability to get a college level job, with debt, and without the ability to pay that debt off. Not only have we not improved their lives, we may have made them worse. And so we know the data for first to second year retention rates. We're at 79%. If you look at first generation Pell eligible African American, Hispanic groups, they're about, depending on the category, six to 10% lower. If we look at our graduation rates for our, for our African American students, it's more than 20% lower. That's not acceptable. I hope you do not think that's acceptable. We can do better. And we've shown that we can do better. And as we operationalize some of the things that we've been working on, we will do better. Last point, finally, um, our state is right in the middle of racial unrest sweeping the country. Uh, we've seen that for the last several years with the Ferguson event, the founding of the Black Lives Matter movement, 
the events at the University of Missouri and how it's impacted them, racial issues on our own campus and in our own community, most recently the events in Oklahoma and North Carolina. This issue is not going to go away and we simply cannot ignore it. And so as we think about what, what we can do, uh, the board rightly insists that we be accountable for how we're going to do on these targets. And thus, they will set for us specific targets and measure our success by how many more students we graduate, by whether we improve our retention and graduation rates overall and for specific subgroups of students, and by what the composition of our workforce is at the end of five years. That brings me to the last uh, slide here that shows our workforce composition numbers. And you can see um, this will be our final metric. I really believe the more diverse we are, the better we are, and the better we're able to serve our students. I've seen that on administrative council. As we have added people uh, of all backgrounds, as we have become uh, more female, uh, and, and as we have become more diverse, our conversation, discussion, and decisions are better. And so we must continue to improve here. We grew about 1% over the last five years. I believe we can grow at least 2.5% in the next five years. But our specific targets, including a specific target in this measure, will be established by the board at its October meeting and I will share the final numbers with you as soon as I have them. So back to the first question, how do we make progress in these areas? Um, some tactics we will use to move the needle will be handled centrally, others by specific units, and some will involve multiple units on campus. We will not, however, be able to graduate more students or significantly improve our graduation rates without the work of every department on campus. Frank's gonna talk about some specific action items that will help achieve these goals. I simply wanted to share with you the rationale of how we got to uh, setting these as goals. He'll talk more about the specifics in a minute. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for helping make this an even better place to work and go to school in the years to come. And so I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna take any questions we have that we've been received, that have been received electronically. Suzanne, where are you? I'm up here. Oh, you're up there. Okay, do we have okay. questions? And, and we have people down in the aisles to pick up cards if you have uh, questions to turn in. Uh, right now, uh, first question is, what strategies have we used to increase retention rates? So, so um, Dr. Kane, who's in the uh, audience today, did some research on this topic several years ago. If I mischaracterize this, Tom, you could, you could correct me. Uh, but I believe his research essentially showed that one of the, the a, a main reason people stay at the university is whether they become connected to the university. Uh, whether, uh, I remember him saying, whether they viewed themselves as a bear. That sounds a little bit corny, but a piece of this is, is how do you connect yourself? And so the whole work that Dr. Cisco's group has done the last several years in working to put together the, the family piece, the, the, the SOAR uh, work, uh, at the, the first week of campus, the focus group pieces, the living learning communities, uh, uh, Bearfest Village, all of the activities that go Traditions Council to connect people to the university is a part of that work. The other part of that work is working on those subgroups of students that aren't staying with us at the same rates as, as our majority students. And so um, Juan Moraz has, has worked very hard with the a multicultural group and, 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 and we used some of that work when they were put together in a cohort uh, in a GEP 101 class, literally 100% of them came back the next year. And we used that work to, to begin putting together first generation GEP 101 classes, many that were connected in a, uh, in a college. Um, and and uh, uh, um, Kelly Wood led that effort out of the provost's office. And we were able to see that we could move that needle by by that work alone. 
And so there are a variety of other first generation projects going on. Mark Biggs has been a great advocate for that. Their student or, our student organizations have, uh, have been formed on that. And so um, um, there, are, there are further efforts I think we need to do in advising. There are further efforts in terms of particularly connecting our African-American students uh, to the university. There's work going on that Michelle Smith, uh, Dr. Michelle Smith is leading a part of that effort out of uh, uh, student affairs. And so there are a variety of things that are going on uh, to try to both connect our students and then support our students. One of the, we're putting together a task force now to, to look at are there financial ways that we can be supportive of students. Uh, and, and that's a broad-based group. Uh, how do we get students that have, that have fallen out to come back? Um, you know, for first-generation students, finding a $300 extra bill could be something that sends them home. How, how do we deal with that? Are there some small kind of scholarship or grant opportunities to, to deal with those problems? So there are a whole variety of things that are going on. The, the getting people to take 30 hours in a year is an important effort because the, uh, that keeps them on track. You know, if, if it takes you five or six years to graduate, we lose some every year and, and you're less likely to make it. And so there, there's a whole uh, series of things that are going on and many of those are set out in the uh, uh, long range pl action plan and Frank's gonna talk about some of those in more detail here in a couple of minutes. That was kind of your five minutes. All right, very good. Frank, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Cliff. My portion of this uh, State of the University is going to somewhat be divided into three sections. Um, first section is what is the foundation we're going to bring into the current coming long range plan of this year. Second, uh, we know that with student success as the uh, lead item in the plan, it's helpful and reflective to look at what are the things that we're already doing, a few of them, that make our students successful. And finally, in our action plan for going into uh, the year and the years beyond, a few salient points. In all cases, what I have to say are just examples and uh, not a complete litany of many things that both are good now and will be needed done in the future. What are the foundation blocks that we bring? It's not just 111 years of history of the university, but it's particularly the last few years, and what do we have? We have an excellent faculty and staff. We do propose that we have many evidences of quality in our curriculum. And of course, having a curriculum that speaks to societal needs and has considerable breadth of the array of opportunities are essential in a university such as we are. And if you look at uh, an another way of saying some of this, there is positive news on a lot of fronts that we're bringing in. A couple of these Cliff mentioned, and I may repeat, but we have the largest number of graduate assistants we've ever had at the university. And coming out of the graduate college for many years, that's a something that is a great thing for our graduate future. We indeed have noted already that we have record numbers in total enrollment, record numbers in the transfer student, but we also have record numbers in our honors program with over 300 this fall enrolled for the first time in the honors program and then the accumulation. Um, we have record number in our doctoral students uh, this year. And so that's another record setting group of things. Student participation in service learning, another record from last year, and we'll hope we set a new one this year with over 4,000 of our students participating in student learning. Uh, we have a record number of study away of over 500 last year. Indeed, undergraduate research has surpassed anything we've ever had in the past. 
And of course, it's been mentioned that we had almost 25 million of grants that occurred last year through faculty and staff efforts. Now, I always hear the question about are we staffing properly? And I think all of us would say that we could use more staffing at every level in every part of the university. But it is uh, with a point of pride that Cliff and I point to the fact that over the last four years, we had our low point in staffing in uh, 2012 at the faculty level of 696. And now we moved up this fall to have 755, just short of 60 greater number in faculty. We also have a greater number in staff. I didn't try to put those statistics together because sometimes it's hard to divide grants in other ways. But this is something that uh, we should note as well. The instructor pool, which are very vital to our university, but that instructor pool has remained essentially the same percentage. And it's 23% this year, and it was 22.4% uh, four years ago. I don't call that statistically different. We do have 10. Uh, distinguished professors now we had four four years ago if we have another indication of the quality of uh, the people that work at this university on the faculty side Cliff mentioned the professor salary incentive program we added 12 people to that program and I'd like to congratulate them publicly here uh, they have shown excellence in teaching research and service across the board and of the 52 that we have given that uh, recognition to, 49 of them still teach at Missouri State University. Uh, we started four years ago the mind's eye uh, indication of snippets of research that would tell the general public what we do in our laboratories, in the field, in our creative arts. And uh, this year uh, we have uh, featured Alicia Mathis on the cover as a person who is doing great research in an endangered species and involving a lot of students. It's a very small salamander, um, but it's the second largest one, I'm told, of the salamanders, and it's a local species. Um, in addition, of course, there are 14 stories in there, and if we look over the several years we've been doing this, we have 50 stories about research done at Missouri State. We could have a whole lot more and will over time, but uh, I think it's an indication of our quality to do that. In terms of programming, our programming uh, has continued to grow with its diverse uh, offerings of curriculum, and so we now have 100 undergraduate majors, and if you extend that to all the options in the major, you add another 85. We also have um, 120 minors, and then we have 13 undergraduate certificates. At the graduate level, we have 60 ways that you can get a distinctive degree, and if you again include the options within some of those degrees, you're over 90. Two-thirds of those graduate programs can connect our undergraduates in an efficient pathway to a degree, having an accelerated master's, and we have over 40 in terms of our um, certificates at the graduate level. Included in our graduate coursework are four doctorates, but we also have two doctorates that we collaboratively work with, the PharmD program and uh, the education degree that we work with MU on. Our curriculum pathways have increasingly diversified. Traditional face-to-face -face is still the big credit hour generator of 82% of uh, the credits we generate, but significant growth has occurred in online and in our blended class opportunities. And then the other two, ITV and Zoom, a very small fraction serving unique populations that can't get easily to the location in a large enough collection. Some of you have never heard of Zoom, I'm sure, but it's much like ITV, except you can have it right at your home computer, and you can be interactive and collaborative uh, with the class at your home computer. If we look at the online programming, uh, the top line of the graph is a focus on summer school. And you see we have just less than half of our summer credit hours generated online, 47 plus percent. 
the bottom line is the fall semester class, and we doubled that in the last five years from 5.6% up to almost 13%. And then if you look at the one number that is a fiscal year, collection over the year, we are at uh, just less than 15% of our credit hours generated online. Much of that is student choice. It's not demand in any case. If we think of the largest single thing that happened last year that brings us into a new long-range plan in a very positive way is that we were accredited, continuing now with the Higher Learning Commission stamp of approval, and we met all criteria, all core components. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't make recommendations. That's a part of their job, and we listen to those recommendations. One of the recommendations fits exactly what we're doing in the plan in the sense of uh, we need to continually work on an inclusive, diverse community, and we are doing that. The second set of things, and I only put a few of the recommendations here, but in assessment, we do have some additional work to keep going on. One of the recommendations, and we have our general education committee looking at this, is that maybe we have too many student learning outcomes and we need to consolidate a bit to better assess what we're doing across the student, across the general education curriculum. And looking at the last point, uh, skipping a little bit here, but um, our way we present the cost of going to school probably could be uh, a little clearer at times, and that's not an easy challenge, but we'll work on it. Uh, <clears throat> now, the second phase here, I want to talk about enhancing student success, and if you look at the kinds of things I mentioned here, what do we know that's most basic about student success? It's really how much we get them involved actively in the learning process. And there are many, many ways to do that. Certainly, we come sometimes refer to uh, experiential learning or personalized education. All of these things are mentioned in the long-range plan as important to this university, no matter what size we become. And our research environment is another way to do some of that and get students involved in research so that the 4,000 plus that were involved last year in undergraduate research, we continue that to the extent possible. Collaboration is mentioned in the long-range plan, and we know that the less we internally isolate and the more we collaborate internally between departments and externally with businesses on internships, collaboration will be important to us. And of course, we'll continually have a growing, expanding curriculum. So I picked out a few snippets of things here that we already are doing, but probably will expand as we go into the future. In the service learning program, I'm particularly proud of the vision screening program. We started this program three years ago, and we screen uh, particularly young children, but some older adults in vision screening with a camera screening process. Students from nursing are involved, from BMS and some other areas. And we screened, as you notice there, about uh, 3,600 last year, last spring, just last spring that way. And about 12% had defects that would need referral, and we have cooperators in the medical community that will accept referrals. This past spring, we started color blindness, and again, I got a little pride in that because I suggested it, but uh, now we're screening color blind condition, and we're finding the national average that uh, about 4% are color deficient, and of course that's mostly males, so it's about 8% for males. If we look at uh, our business students, they're about ready, uh, as soon as the hammering's finished, to open a success center, and that success center is going to have uh, an increase in the uh, learning processes that hopefully they get more real-world type laboratory experiences, and so you see we have five areas there that they can gain that kind of experience in the process. And I'm not going to read them off, but uh, you notice advertising and trading in there. Now, not only is that, but uh, 
our business program students have been given great opportunities in uh, their career advancement through having the career fair. Over a thousand participated last week. And in that process, they've taken the time to give attention to giving um, education on interview process in advance and to be sure they can dress appropriately. And so some have had business attire being purchased by uh, the goodwill of the College of Business. If we look at uh, the Teacher Academy, something started last year. The Teacher Academy placed 26 students in a school system for elementary education training. They had good supervision. They showed what they could do. They did well. And indeed, 90% in an elementary education, 90% were placed in jobs immediately upon getting out. This year, we have our second group in the Teacher Academy starting. Giving voice comes from our theater department, where in the last uh, couple of years, they've been using a theater as a way to give expression to some of the uh, issues in society that need attention and need education for everyone. And the troop of people does interviewing, creates a script, and then puts on performances for many of our classes, for local businesses, and even at the national level. They recently were at a conference in San Diego. Collaborative research, I mentioned earlier, but in a little more detail in the Department of Sociology and, all, and Anthropology and also connected to media journalism and film. We have a project going on that gets students involved in interviewing and as a part of the research, they're able to help develop the uh, underrepresented history here of the uh, African American community. The important point in all of these things I'm making is that we get students involved in things, and that will help students stay. Collaboration also is a, an emphasis here on uh, the fact that we have brought in now, this is our second year, but last year 60 students came in from Ninsha, China. They would take our classes with our agriculture students, and I was at their closing uh, uh, award ceremony, not a degree, but it almost made you cry, and I can do that pretty easily at times, uh, to see how, how beautifully they expressed the feelings for the program. And our students that are the native student in close proximity had that same feeling. We're in our second group of those students now. In terms of grant funding, the uh, faculty and the College of Natural and Applied Science have been particularly focused on getting grants that help students get involved and help them then in their career fields. The first one I noted in this slide is simply that uh, we have a grant that funded 21 students for $3,100 last year, and that will be repeated in another year, and they got a lot of mentoring. I'm sure it's going to advance them in their careers. They took physics and calculus, which all of you, of course, have taken. And uh, uh, it's, it's a way to move forward in a specific niche area. The second grant mentioned is one in which we have 12 math students that uh, are working closely in research areas and in creative work in the math field. Again, uh, they got some funding. Not all the grants give funding, but they often give experiences. Overall, the, the CNAS faculty were the leaders in terms of their size of bringing in, or excuse me, submitting 115 proposals, bringing in over 70 grants at over $3 million. Almost always, students are written into the grant process. We showcase our student research as well. And in the graduate college, they've been funding for several years now. The, uh, graduate student research that leads to a publication in the way of a presentation or a publication, but over 80 students were given awards last year, and I know several of our departments add to the amount of money to help them get to make a presentation. At the interdisciplinary fair, there were 150 presentations, 50 of them orally. At the um, College of Health and Human Services fair, there were 80 plus students that were involved in posters, and in CNAS, over 60 were involved in posters. Other things are going on, but these are examples. 
MSU Care was, I thought, one of the more significant things that we've done in a long time. So last year that opened in the mid-fall of the year, and MSU Care is really first and primarily about giving our students experiences. Equally important maybe, but it is secondary, and that is helping those low-income people who need health care. But uh, these students are mentored by faculty in physician's assistant studies, faculty from nursing, both the doctorate and um, other parts of nursing. They're mentored, again, in another way in that some referrals are made to the physical therapy clinic. The bottom line is we serve now over 400 people from the outside in health care every, every uh, month, plus we get a lot of student experience. Now, there's not a direct connection here, but uh, our students are being successful entering medical professions. This gives us an idea. We had 21 of our 30 students that applied to medical school last year get in for this year. They came from five different academic departments here at Missouri State. They got into 12 different medical schools. Pretty remarkable percentage of success there. Further, if we look, we can and should and will continue to recruit undergraduates to come here knowing they have a career pathway in the professional health areas above the undergraduate level. And the numbers here in our doctorate of pharmacy class, uh, 22 of the current class that just came in came from Missouri State. And if you look at the other numbers, um, the next uh, two of them, not quite 50%, 14 of 32 came from uh, Missouri State in phys physician's assistant, 17 of 40 in the physical therapy program, occupational therapy was at a third, and on down the line here, and our master's in communication science disorder was a little over half coming from our own undergraduates. We should recruit to come here with a long-term future for our students. Now, in this year and beyond is where we specifically look at a few, some of the action plan things we are hoping to do and will be doing. And if we look at uh, these, I can only take a few out of the very long action plan. If you saw it, uh, you probably talked about the file 13. Some of you might have actually used it already, but I hope not. Um, but we have a dynamic curriculum, and I know that's on your mind. We anticipate this year at least these new programs in front of you coming through the process. We're looking at an undergraduate degree in uh, agricultural communication and four graduate degrees that are noted. And there may be others that I don't know about. These are things that uh, the faculty have told me they're in process in doing. The last one on athletic training, we already have a master's, but we have to move to a different kind of master's, so it's an entry-level master's instead of a post-professional master's. And that's mandated by the accrediting society, and it'll be an entirely different degree. Uh, <clears throat> we do want to make a more inclusive community, and this comes out in our necessity to recruit, to hire right, and we know we have some focus on that for the last several years, and we have inched up a little bit, and we want to include more training. Most recently, we've had some training for the new um, <coughs> administrators, academic administrators, and we have also started that training process now for some of the new faculty, and it will be further refined and moved forward as the year goes on. The early emphasis on retention has been a focus primarily on the GEP 101 class and what we're doing there. Cliff has already mentioned that we've had success when students were in the first generation type segments and success when they're in college type segments. In fact, from very small amount of data of a couple of years, we've been able to close the gap when we've had those most specialized sections. So we will at minimum double those sections going into the next year and hopefully that will be a piece of the puzzle. And living and learning communities, some of you are going to be on a committee to further uh, uh, help those processes go forward in, in evaluating and doing them. The action plan uh, calls us to 
do more in the way of math and English where we have remedial coursework and we know we have uh, student issues for getting through some of those basic things. So uh, we will have pilot project, projects in both math and English under what's now referred to as a co-requisite model where they don't take the remedial coursework but they build in more time and assistance into the required course with the idea that it can eventually make them more likely to succeed than a sequence of two courses. In addition, we'll be uh, trying out some thing over ne probably next fall where we use more uh, problems that are applicable like to business in terms of our college algebra course where the business students would be taking it. My grandson at West Point has exactly that kind of an approach in his math class where they're using specific kind of problem orientation of this nature. We know that decreasing time to graduation is an important issue in student success. There are many ways, this is only a few of them, but I think that we have indeed uh, a range of opportunities. We can keep our students better informed. And Nathan Hoff is in the process of running sessions for you on the student planner, which gives them better information. We will have a workshop here October 12th on uh, 15 to finish type things, uh, and that's a major part of it at least. We have found that second block courses give people a fresh opportunity. We will increase second block courses. And uh, in several colleges, we have volunteers of majors that want to try structured schedules. And these are volunteer trials, but we think it needs to be evaluated. And going on to the right-hand side, reducing credit hours is an issue. We are the largest credit hour requirement uh, four-year institution in the state of Missouri. We should discuss that, and we will discuss it. Doesn't mean it's a mandate, but it probably needs to be evaluated and looked at. Advising is a key no matter what we do. And the point here is not that we do poor advising. The point is we always need to look at our advising and see how we can structure it to give the students the best in opportunities. And that includes not just advising for incoming freshmen, but advising for transfer students. they are almost 1,800 in the record now. And advising for graduate students. And so that's a part of our action planning. And the idea is to streamline it and make it where their barriers are less. Now, I use this last slide, and I'd like to put a whole lot more on it. But the point in this last slide is if we want retention and if we want graduation success, it's not one magic bullet. There are multiple things, and they start in those multiple things, probably with the personal attention that we give our students. And I've tried to make a point of that, but. Uh, I think I close with something I did in the, as a quote in uh, Welcome Back Luncheon. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's the point here. Uh, we need to continue to give attention to our students in every way and including uh, just these but a lot more. Thank you very much. All right, before we go to the microphone questions, does anyone, uh, Suzanne, were there questions that were passed in? Yes. And, All right, Frank. Uh, the first one is actually, I think, for both of you. Uh, as faculty and staff become more diverse, what support will these new employees receive? Say, say that again. As faculty and staff become more diverse, what support will these new employees receive? Go ahead. Well, on the faculty side, we're certainly trying to give them more exposure to what we might call educational things in terms of how different cultures can operate, how to deal with topics that may be sensitive. That's a prime thing. Uh, support, of course, is, um, what are we calling the um, groups? Affinity groups, sorry, Wes, but affinity groups are being formed, and affinity groups give you a combination of people that uh, can kind of think together and uh, support each other. Those are the kinds of things that are currently 
uh, in planning and going on? You know, I, I, w I would add to that that uh, we established two years ago a staff mentorship program, so all new employees get a staff mentor if they request one. Um, as a part of uh, beginning to work on or expanding our affinity groups, uh, Wes Pratt and, uh, let's see, uh, Michelle Smith and Gilbert Brown are hosting at my home uh, uh, a gathering next week to, to bring uh, some of our diverse professional staff and faculty together to connect with each other. Uh, there's also training for majority staff and faculty to, to help them better uh, identify issues and so uh, a variety of things in process there. Okay, and one more for uh, Frank. Adjunct nationally don't get adequate pay. What's MSU doing to ensure they can afford to live in Springfield and teach their load? Would you repeat that? I didn't get the first part. Adjunct faculty nationally don't get adequate pay. What's Missouri State doing to ensure they can afford to live in Springfield and teach their load? Well, I think we've been working every year on the pay proposition. And of course, uh, part of it is you have to want to be in the environment we're in. Um, we will not have an unlimited supply of new money. Um, so I think the fact that Springfield is a little cheaper nationally helps, but we will continue to work on salary improvement every year. Cliff and I have worked on it. We will continue to work on it. I would say that our focus primarily has been on our full-time uh, faculty and staff. Um, people that work uh, in the adjunct field are, as my understanding is, typically have other employment and they're teaching a class or two here by and large and so that is left with the, each dean to, uh, uh, to set those pay. We did several years ago set a floor and raised that floor for adjunct faculty but that has been frankly less of a focus given our uh, the work that we needed to do on our full-time folks. And we're not as far off from the national as you might think. All right, with that, we'll take questions from the audience. Who's got our microphones? We have, so we have four microphones that are going down, so if you can wait to get a microphone. <clears throat> All right, I see uh, Keyshore's hand is up, and uh, as the tradition continues in year six, Keyshore will ask the first question. Thank you, Cliff. Cliff and everybody in the higher administration are doing excellent job. Very good. I have two questions. Okay. There are two main candidates running for the governor of Missouri position. Many, many, many faculty and staff and students at MSU would like to vote for that candidate uh, who supports higher education strongly because that will benefit our university. Given that, would you be willing to tell us who is the candidate you are supporting? Not in a million years. Um, however, if you want to text me that question, I, uh, I'll probably respond. I, I would say this. Um, I do think either candidate uh, potentially can be a supporter of higher education. Um, um, because their backgrounds and experiences would indicate that to be the case. Uh, I know both of the candidates personally. They have good, uh, uh, have a good relationship with them. They have great regard for our campus. They've both been on campus and had interaction with, with our leadership team. And so I do not think there's a bad choice on this, but I'm not going to uh, f uh, share how I'm going to vote, at least in front of 400 people and on television. So, <laughs> what's the second question? Thank you, Claire. Uh, my second question is a bit unusual. University is obviously doing excellent in every area, but I'm wondering about fundamentals of academics such as reading and writing. Why is the university not emphasizing deeper reading, more and more reading, and also better and better writing. For example, the students who graduate out of MSU, are they continuing their reading? Are they writing better and better? D 
Do you have any information in this area of fundamentals, reading and writing? So Frank, think, be thinking here. I'm going to turn this over to you in a second. Um, so so um, if, if you were at the uh, uh, back to school faculty lunch, one of, my talk put up some data that showed in our classes here how much time our students spend in a variety of, of, of things, studying, reading, uh, writing papers, et cetera. Um, in all of those, we were slightly below average. And frankly, I encouraged our faculty that teach those classes to dig in and, 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 and lead rigorous classes. And, and so I think we are encouraging those kinds of skills. Um, Frank, what else would you say? This is not a structural problem of our curriculum. This comes down to peer pressure from each other of what you really want to do. And then you, for example, I think criminal justice a few years ago put a heavy emphasis on writing in their curriculum. And that's one example. But they decided that internally. And I think that's what, it, it's not like we add another course, in my opinion, it's personal uh, investment of what faculty think is what should be done that's going to solve that. So, so the, the, the whole emphasis on increasing the number of graduates, uh, improving our graduation and retention groups, particularly for subcategories, don't interpret that at all to mean we want to just get people through and we don't care if they can do the work. It, it is not a, a, a push to reduce rigor. In fact, I, I, I think as we increase rigor, that we will see that our students will rise to the occasion and, and be successful in that environment. So um, we're with you on that, on that second emphasis. Thank you very much. I have a question on a card. OK, go ahead. And I'm over here. Uh, how will the university deal with the overtime law otherwise known as FLSA, that's coming on December 1st? Great, great question. I, I think uh, I'm very proud of how our team has worked on this. And so uh, let me give you the timeline, and then I'll give you some, some uh, uh, general information. So um, uh, background on FSLA, the short version of this, is that uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act 60, 70 years ago, created uh, minimum wage and overtime rules um, and, and set the, the how, how you fit into who and then created exemptions from the overtime piece. So our rule for the last 20 years had been um, if you were a salaried professional executive administrative um, worker and you made at least $23,000 a year, then you worked however many hours you worked. That may have been 40 hours one week and 80 hours the next and you didn't get overtime and it was you were a salaried professional employee. So the rule is changing December 1. The new minimum to be in that category is $47,500, less a couple dollars. Um, and so we have, ha we have had to evaluate what do we do with our professional employees that are now making less than the $47,476 minimum. Um, there are lots of choices of how you could comply with that law. Uh, there are four million workers impacted in the United States by this new law. Um, and, and so th there were options to uh, lay people off. That's a, that's a route many people are going. Another acceptable option would have been to lower people's salary and then pay them overtime uh, to get up to what they're raising now. Um, uh, we are going to roll out on Friday of this week. Every employee impacted will get a letter and meet with their supervisor to let them know how we're handling this situation. Um, overall, we're moving, let me tell you what we're not doing. We didn't lower anybody's salary. And on the Springfield campus, we have not laid off a single person. We also did not decrease anyone's benefits in terms of vacation time if you moved from exempt to non-exempt. Those are the two categories. So we have tried to uh, embrace, uh, adopt the new rule in a very employee-friendly, uh, positive way. So 186 people 
We'll move now from what is a salary position to an hourly position. Their income will be the same. If they now work more than 40 hours a week, they will be paid overtime. Um, they w we have created a class that refers to them as professional non-exempt. Um, they keep the same vacation that they had if they were exempt. So we hope that we have dealt with that situation of many of our professional staff uh, in as positive and pro-employee way as we have. Additionally, we have raised the pay of 66 of, of our employees to meet the new minimum to remain salaried employees. We were able to fund that. It's about a $75,000 expenditure through uh, money that was allocated for pay raises for this fiscal year of people that left the university. So we funded that centrally, and, we, and so 66 people will get a pay raise December 1st. Another 186 people will go to hourly at the same level they're making now, and if they work overtime, will be paid overtime. Those people keep their employees. Um, teachers don't, instructional personnel, teachers, coaches, um, um, what's the other term? Academic administrator uh, professionals. Academic administrator professionals. Many of our student affairs folks are in that category. The minimum in that category is $40,000 on our campus, and so a variety of people either got raised up to that or they are, they're still salaried employees under that category. We will put out a note to everyone from me on Friday, and there'll be a cliff note on Tuesday that summarizes all of this. I want to thank our team uh, in HR, led by Tammy Few and Lynn McKinsey, Matt Morris, Rachel Dockery of General Counsel's Office, uh, Suzanne Shaw in our in, in our communications piece. Our team has worked very hard to, to put as little negative impact on this enormous change on our employees, and I'm very proud of the good work that we've done on this area. The West Plains folks did good work too. It's, I just don't have that data in front of me. Other questions? I have one last one up here. Okay. Money, again. Uh, are any discussions being held regarding the restoration of merit-based raises as opposed to across-the-board raises? Um, we have had those conversations in the last couple of years as, uh, uh, you know, based on th through the Executive Budget Committee uh, on that. In terms of the staff side, we actually have done. That's the, the staff pool that was, I think, $250,000 last year, uh, was distributed by cost center heads in part based on merit. Not completely, but in part based on merit. Uh, and so I know, for example, that I, in my category of folks, I had a certain amount of money to distribute, and I had their ADP scores of all our staff over the last multiple years. And so I was able to look at both who's being paid below midpoint, who's being paid you know, on the lower end of the scale, whether they're above or below midpoint, and merit ability to factor in those raises. And I think our cost center heads all followed similar kinds of logic. We've not done merit-based pay on faculty. Um, if uh, our, our policies require that if we're able to do above a 2% raise, then anything above 2% has to be distributed based on merit. And so our ability to fund that, frankly, is, is, is going to be determined by how much new money there is. Anything else? That's, that's what we have from up here. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right, thanks for coming out.